Well, it's championship week. You're the reigning champions. How about last Sunday? I thought it was a good day. Do you think it was a good day? Yeah, I think it was really good. It was, uh, we stayed on track, didn't wear our stuff out, and, and finally got back in the winner's circle. That was a nice feeling. Pit stops, got another good one in. Yeah, uh, came down to pressure situation, you know, and the Warriors stepped up. Uh, Jeff was real good hitting the marks all day. Uh, I think there's a lot of people wondering what happened, but, uh, you know, having the champions pit and then uh, getting the car out first, it, it made the difference. Well, we were listening. He was really coaching you on Sunday. He's a good coach, man. Uh, you know, he's, uh, he's got to calm me down. He's got to pump me up. He's got to do all these things. Uh, and to me, a crew chief these days is just like being a coach. You know, keeping everybody pumped up and focused. Uh, that, that's a lot of times three-pointer. That's his job. But uh, we, we wanted to communicate a lot more this weekend than we have in the past. And, uh, you know, we were able to do that. So, uh, and it worked. <laughs> Atmosphere a little different here than it's been the last two weeks? It, it was kind of shock. You know, we, we came back from Daytona, moved into a new shop. We, were, we felt like we were a little bit off there. Never got a chance to get going at Rockingham. Uh, never got a chance really to, to adjust on the car, or get going. So it's a lot more relaxed here today, as you can tell. Well, back to Atlanta, good track for you. We've got a, a car that we've never raced before, and it's a sister car to the car that we ran at uh, Richmond. And we, we've got a good feeling. Jeff knows how to, to win at Atlanta. We won our first ever race together at Atlanta, as a matter of fact. So it, it brings back good memories. This race last year was really good for us, and uh, you know I think that it can be good for us again. So uh, we're we're looking forward to it. Uh, you know, rule changes uh, a little bit. You know, we haven't tested there at Atlanta, but uh, we just had a good meeting. And, you know, horsepower-wise, I think we're pretty decent, and uh, I think our cars are going to be pretty good too. So uh, you know, coming off of a win like last weekend, that confidence will do more for you than any other thing sometimes. Well. One on one, you two guys, who's gonna win it? One on one, who's gonna win? Basketball or uh, racing? <laughs> no. <laughs> I had him beat, I gotta say, I had him beat. Every chance we get, uh, if we've got a day off, it's great, you know. I can just run down on the boat dock, and and, uh, and these things are so so simple to, to get started these days. You just jump in and go. Uh, and and whether I'm skiing or, or whether I'm just you know riding around, we can even go eat on, on the lake. So uh, it's certainly something that I like to do, uh, and would like to do more of. Gordon takes a look again. Rusty comes down, slams the door. Gordon on ahead. Here comes Jeff Gordon to take the lead. Gordon takes the lead. Rusty slips. Jeff Gordon will win at Bristol, Tennessee. Certainly in my Winston Cup career, have not ever won a, a race on the white flag lap. So that was exciting. Uh, and, and, you know, just to be on a short track, bumping and grinding, you know, all the way to the finish. Uh, that that was exciting for me and I think everybody at home and everybody that was watching. So I know the team was pumped up and I was just as pumped up. I made some spectacular passes, but I, this this one uh, with Rusty and I was was one of the most exciting and spectacular ones for me uh, to to be in in front of a crowd of over 100,000 people and and uh, to see them stand on their feet and uh, you know to to win at Bristol in that fashion is something that will definitely go down in, in history of my career. The field comes down, the green flag is out, and the Haynes 500 is underway at Marshallsville. We need to qualify well. Uh, we haven't qualified as well as we would like to have the last couple times at Martinsville and for, for some reason that, that's one area where, where we need to improve on because it's so important to qualify these days to, to get a good starting position but also to, uh, to get a good pit stall. Uh, so you know that, that's something we're going to be focusing on. I think when we get in the race, uh, you know our, our race setup that we've got there uh, and the, the, the line that I've been able to find the last couple of times will hopefully uh, you know, pay off. But I'm hoping that we're real strong when it comes to the race. The short tracks to me are an area that I had to work on. We were a little bit off. I felt like I, I you know, need to have a little more patience with the track. Uh, you can get yourself in trouble real easy on the short tracks, and I think that's why it's so important to focus on it. And on the pole, from, where are you from? Seattle. From Seattle, it's Kenny Man. Woo! Woo! Feeling good about it.
And on the outside, Paul. Somebody introduce Gordon, man. He's getting dog. I feel good about having the pull. I mean, my whole crew's been working great this week. Got this thing revved up. Kick Gordon's ass. We're going five laps, one lap of pace. You feeling out your car? Good luck. <laughs> You wanted to go, you had to go to your business meetings. Good that, race, that man. That was good, that was good, a lot of fun. Is this almost unfair having this kind of preparation for the you, Daytona 500? You know what I felt like? I felt like I was over there at Daytona. I couldn't pass. <laughs> I had too much spoiler. <laughs> but, but the other drivers didn't get this preparation. I mean, Earnhardt, Labonte, those guys, they're doing you know, other stuff. Yeah, yeah this, you, you know that they're not out practicing with, you know, top-notch drivers like yourself and uh, competing like we did. You, you, you feel like you need to give them a couple laps on Sunday or? I have to have him come over and take a few. I, I think this would be worth their while. All right, Jeff. Congratulations thanks, thanks. for second All spot. Right. Yeah. It's Can not I bad. get a trophy or money? You're or second in points right now. No, second in points. Is, is this better than the IROC series? I mean, really? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's close. That was fun. We can bring those guys over here. You though. were banging hard. I saw. I, I couldn't give you that extra little gap. Well, you wouldn't give me any room. You should have gave me a little bit of room. Just gave me a chance. <laughs> I was trying to push you out of the way. I was just trying to hold on to the lead. I had a faster car. That's all I got to say. I had a much faster you car. You should kick. We should. I should have had him kick in his car afterward, <laughs> like so wrong. All right. Good job, right, man. man. That was really fun. That, that was fun. I loved it. I can brag about this the rest of my life. Hey, what time? You're kind of mad now. You okay with it? Oh yeah. Yeah, man. Now, is this, yeah. is this literally how you started in the race? You just one day, one day said, oh, I want to go go-kart riding? Oh, come on. Oh, look at these. Uh, no. no, I mean, like when you were like six years old no. or four years old or whatever. No, no, no. It's, think they run these sure. it started professionally. When you were like five? Yeah. I mean, it's like, wouldn't like get a track with, like this. Come on. Let's go. He's going down this time. I let him win that other one, but he's going down this time. A little more challenging this time. We got a road course. A few more turns. You I just, think you missed that. What I meant was like when you were like four years old and went to the, the fair or whatever. You tell me. The very me. first time I was ever in a race car was a real. Was Seriously? A, yeah. I never knew that. You want me to give you the pole again? Scissor, paper, rock. Huh? Scissor, paper, rock. Okay. One, two, three. Ah! Ready? Ready? Ah! You're tied for first of the season points That's then. Right. I mean, you you know, watch. you finished third. Oh. <laughs> Gordon's going to be good. When he gets a little old, a couple more years on his belt, I think he's going to be a good driver. 
Exactly one week after terminating a long-term agreement with crew chief Ray Evernham, car owner Rick Hendrick announced Wednesday a new lifetime contract for driver Jeff Gordon, a package that includes partial ownership of the 24 team. I am extremely happy to be standing here in front of you today uh, to announce a, a deal with Jeff Gordon that's going to be a lifetime deal that uh, he's going to have an equity partnership in the 24 team and we're going to race together for as long as we race. The size of Gordon's ownership share of the 24 team was not disclosed, but he now owns a piece of the team, providing a peace of mind for the future. It is part of my job, not just to drive that race car the best that I can, but also to be there, you know, for those guys, supporting them uh, and, and, you know, keeping that excitement within the team. And I hope that this announcement uh, shows everybody how committed and excited I am about driving this 24 car for the rest of my career. It took a lot of, uh, of, of my accountants and a lot of his advisors, and this was not something that you put together over a week or two. It was a very well thought out plan. I don't see a whole lot changing over the next uh, you know, year or so. It's uh, probably more two or three years down the road when, uh, you know, when I'm going to want to do a whole lot more. But this is just one little you know, step uh, that we're taking right now towards that. The contract negotiations have taken more than a year. Gordon admits the whole process has been a distraction. But his third and final contract with Hendrick Motorsports was an important career decision. Trust me, there was a lot of uh, offers that were out there, a lot of people that, that uh, you know, approached me. Um, none of them, you know, were like this. Some of them were pretty interesting. And, and uh, you know, I always get asked, you want to own your own team? I don't want to own my own team, but I'd love to be a partner with Rick Hendrick. And I've always said that. I'd always said that I wanted to be more involved with Hendrick Motorsports. And this is, uh, this is that time, this is that opportunity I was looking for. Competition is going to be, going to be fierce. And I think he's at the prime of his life. He doesn't need to, if he's got to known, he doesn't need to back up and try something different. Neither do I. I mean, I, I, that's kind of the way I feel. I, I think I found the golden goose. I'm going to keep as long as I can. Jeff Gordon also addressed the situation concerning his Bush Series team, co-owned with former Winston Cup crew chief Ray Evernham. Gordon will compete in five races in the year 2000, but beyond next season, he's not sure what lies ahead for Gordon Evernham Motorsports. In Concord, North Carolina, I'm Matt Yoakum, ESPN. I started to slip a little bit in the confidence level. There were, there were times when, uh, you know, we just, we put every kind of combination of spring shocks, sway bars underneath the car. It just didn't matter, you know, and, you know, I just, I'd come in and I was frustrated. So, man, it just doesn't feel right, you know. I don't know, maybe I just, maybe I'm just doing something you know, because we got our teammate Jerry Nadeau over there, you know, they were running really good, like especially place at Charlotte. He ran real well. You know, we put the same setup underneath the car, you know, and it wasn't working for us. So you start to lose some confidence, for sure. Confidence is a lot like momentum or chemistry. It's intangible, an ambiguous term, impossible to measure. As a result, appreciating its impact is difficult. But this much is certain. Teams that don't have it, don't win. And that would seem to be the difference this year in the 24 team. They just know they're good. I'm just looking at this year versus last year. I mean, I think at this point last year we were out of the championship. <laughs> you know, we just didn't have a prayer. And we were, we were just trying to rebuild the team and, and you know, get, get some magic, get something going, uh, get our cars, you know, more competitive. I mean, we were dealing with so many factors. And what a difference a year makes. I mean, this, this year things have been you know, very good. The team, oh man, they're just working so well together. Their attitude in the shop and at the racetrack is, is great. And, and their confidence level, all, all of us, you know, and, and I really think that what we went through last year has really made us uh, a much stronger team than maybe we've ever been as a, as a unit. 2000 was Jeff Gordon's year of transition. Ray Evernham, the crew chief with whom Gordon won three championships, had moved on, prompting many to predict the 24's demise. There would, in fact, be a step back. But the addition of Robbie Loomis provided a platform to rebuild, and rebuild quickly. I think I wanted to show people that, that you know, maybe, maybe I, I deserve, you know, a little more credit, you know, that I thought maybe I was just a little disappointed that the outside perception was that this whole team is based around one person. Um, 
Ray Everham is an extremely talented crew chief, and I want I, I always tried to give him as much credit as I could when, when he worked for us, and I still give him a tremendous amount of credit for what he's doing with the Dodge program and, and you know what he's going to accomplish in the future, because I just think a lot of him, but I think even he would tell you that 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 he didn't do his job if that team revolved around him and only him. I don't want it to sound like, you know, oh boy, you know, we're just going to go out there and show them and prove to them that, that Ray didn't have anything to do with it because he had a lot to do with the success that we had. But I think he, he taught us a lot about how to have success in the future too. Make no mistake, it's the short-term future that Gordon speaks of. This is no longer the we're getting better, Jeff Gordon. This is the we are better and we're going to win, Jeff Gordon. Last year's second would have been a great season for us. This year, the way we've started, um, you know, the, the way we've performed, we, we know that we're championship caliber and, and second is, is not good enough for us. And we're gonna do everything. We'll, we'll settle for it when it's all over because that's what, that's what you get, you know. But uh, we're not gonna give up until, until we win the championship. And we feel like we've got a great opportunity to do that this year. We need to get into Victor Land. I mean, it would be very nice. It would it would help a lot of things. Winning solves a lot of a lot of things. But um, you know, we're not really sitting here saying, you know, boy, if we don't win, we're gonna we're gonna you know just fall apart. All in all, you know, I can't see us changing a whole lot. Uh, I mean, when you have a squeegee fall off the end of the stick, you have you know uh, some of the crazy things that have happened to us this year. You can't all of a sudden just change everything you're doing because we're not that bad. Do you think that people judge you unfairly based on the level of success you've had in the past? No, I think we've, we've created that, you know, and that's a good thing. I mean, to win 58 races and four championships, I'm not, I'm not disappointed in that at all, but what comes along with that type of success are high expectations and, and you know, it's a great story when you're not, you know, living up to your statistics and so, uh, and it's a great story when you're over and above your statistics. So, I mean, both sides of it, you know, are, are just interesting, not only, you know, uh, to the media, but to the fans, and that's, that's a story. That's what people want to hear about. For us, it's just racing, you know, and we're just going about it the best way we can. When there are expectations and you don't live up to those expectations uh, and you know how hard you're working, it can get frustrating at times. And, you know, I've seen different levels of frustration you know for myself and for Robbie and different members of the team but all in all they, they've handled you know this year very very well and I think I, I and I know I see a look in their eye that hey we know it's gonna come we know what it's gonna take and and we're not going anywhere you have not given up on the championship yet oh no I mean you know we're only what a little over a third of the way through the season way too much racing. I mean, if Sterling was out there winning every other weekend, you know, we'd be in, we'd be in trouble. He's had good luck and he's had good runs. But, um, you know, I think that, that right now you got to look at Matt Kenseth and Kurt Busch. I mean, there's some guys that have some momentum on their side and you got to kind of watch those guys. We definitely need to get our act together. We got to get some momentum if we're going to have a shot at it, but we're definitely not out of it. Jeff, you appear to be a kid in the candy store today. Was it as much fun as you thought it would be? Uh, far better than I ever expected. What a, an awesome experience. I, I've never driven a car that has that much downforce, that much you know, acceleration. I love the Winston Cup car, but it's just a different type of ride. And when you're on a road course like this, there's no machine that performs better in a Formula One car. I didn't think it was going to be that much fun. <laughs> you know, I was pushing. I'm not going to say I wasn't because I was pushing. What surprised you the most about this car? Um, the power <laughs> and the lack of brakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different game where in NASCAR you really got to look after the car a lot more, and where F1 you just got to drive the wheels over. Jeff, what would be the circumstances that would possibly put you in a Formula One race? I don't think there would be any. Uh, 
you know, I'm so committed to Winston Cup and Hendrick Motorsports, and uh, I, you know, I made that career choice a long time ago, uh, and that's what makes this so sweet for me is that I know where I'm going to be. I know where I'm going to be on Sundays, and and my I have so many challenges and things that I want to still do in Winston Cup, but to just get that opportunity uh, to to go around a track in a Formula One car, and, and that caliber of Formula One car, and that it's fun. It just it wasn't about competition, it wasn't about anything other than just pure fun, and, and I don't know, I don't have any aspirations, and, and really don't have the commitment to go Formula One, and that I love Winston Cup. I've always been a fan of fluorescent colors, and when DuPont contracted me to design Jeff Gordon's first race car, I thought, hey, what a beautiful marriage. I mean, here I am, an artist, and I'm doing a paint scheme for a paint company, you know? So basically anything I come up with, I know they'll be able to manufacture and make. And, and I thought it would be really important to project that race car as representing that DuPont could manufacture a rainbow of colors. So I kind of had this idea that I wanted to integrate, you know, the graphics of a rainbow in the car. And, and the whole design is built around the DuPont oval on the hood. The slope, uh, you know, of that, of that um, logo kind of formed the foundation for the arcs of the rainbow. And I'll never forget when, when they first painted the car going over to Hendrick Motorsports and they, they literally rolled out a gray primer uh, Lumina for me. And I got to take a pencil and kind of, you know, say, well, you know, this is about the width of the lines and, and this is how I see the thing, you know, working on the, around the logo and everything. And I thought the guys in the body shop were gonna kill me because the arcs, it's not, it, you know, it's pretty easy to tape a straight line. It's a little more difficult to get an arc or a rainbow effect. And, and then there were several different colors on that race car and fluorescent paints, which required a two-step process. So it was pretty involved, but, but when they rolled it out the first time and saw how it just jumped out and, and how beautiful it was. I mean, they really got excited about it. And, and those guys over there at that 24 team, I mean, they always roll out just immaculately prepared cars. It was amazing the attention that that paint scheme generated. Jeff Gordon coming in to the sport, I mean, kind of defined a new role um, and, and, and kind of set the new pattern for race drivers. He was young and flashy, you know, and, and, and aggressive, and that car was so colorful and easy to, easy to land on in, in the track, on, on the field, and he would take it right to the front, you know, so it made it stand out even more. Um, I think it's had a big impact on the sport um, uh, in, in the sense that um, it kind of showed uh, uh, fans and sponsors alike uh, the importance of graphics on the race car, and it kind of opened up um, some, some thought processes as to how elaborate the paint schemes could be on the race car. The car became an icon in the sport, thankfully, you know, and, and they ran that same paint scheme through the rest of the 90s, and then in uh, 2000, we met at Daytona, and we had just about exhausted every uh, merchandising possibility with graphics and everything off the rainbow car, and everybody agreed, hey, it's kind of time for a change. And DuPont called me and said, we want to meet in Daytona and talk about changing the paint scheme. This was in 2000. And I was a nervous wreck because that paint scheme had become so famous and I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I don't want to be known as the guy that killed the rainbow and, you know, and then blew it on the next paint scheme. So the seriousness of it is it took DuPont a long time and a lot of meetings to decide, okay, we're going to change this paint scheme. I mean, that was an arduous process. But then we started working on new looks in Daytona of 2000 and did not debut that paint scheme until December later that year. And there were like 64 different layouts and revisions that I did during the course of that year, all very similar, 
um, you know, I mean, in the whole scope of things, but they were all meticulously looked at and thought about and tweaked on and everything else because DuPont and, and Jeff Gordon and his whole organization and Hendrick Motorsports, they all wanted to make sure that when we did the new paint scheme, it was done right. And, and it was amazing to me that when the new paint scheme rolled out and debuted, I mean, people had loved the rainbow paint scheme, but all of a sudden there was a brand new icon. And the flames, I mean, look how many flame cars have been done since that time. So it, it, was, it was pretty cool, you know, and it just kind of, it made a, 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 just a kind of a seamless, you know, progression, although it was totally different. And, and one of the things that I made sure that I did whenever I designed that paint scheme was although it was totally different graphics on the car, it still had a red front, a red back, yellow numbers in the middle, and used the same coloration as the other car so that the one thing I was scared to death was I did not want people to go to the racetrack and go, what happened to Jeff Gordon's car, you know? And, and it, it worked. And I was so proud that it worked as well as it did.